Welcome to the Guild Family Stream. Jesus is King. Welcome to the Meaning of Catholic. Opinions expressed here do not necessarily reflect those of everyone at Meaning of Catholic. This is a cooperative lay apostolate. We're trying to build an online guild community where we can support each other against the Marxists. I'm Timothy Flanders. Jesus is King. This is the Guild Family Stream where we talk about all the most controversial topics and we work to support each other across countries. So we're going to talk about your questions. And first, I want to announce and continue to talk about the exciting new institution we're trying to build online, which is an online homeschool and adult education institution that is a cooperative in effort. It's called Mary Queen of the Home Academy. And this is, uh, we have our lay patrons at Meaning of Catholic. And one of them is Mary Queen of the Home. And so if you go to meaningofcatholic.com slash academy, you can see all of the courses that are available to you. So the, there's uh, discounts for guild members. Uh, I have four courses that I'm, I'm starting in October uh, based on my two books, as well as Latin 101. So we have two courses for high schoolers. One is the, is the Holy Bible, the Bible course, Introduction to the Holy Bible. That's for high schoolers. And then we have a Latin 101 course for high schoolers as well. And then we have an adult course on the ancient world. That'll be based on my book, City of God versus City of Man. And then there'll also be an adult Latin class. Both of the Latin classes will be taking all the Latin straight from the Latin mass, the Latin missal. So it'll be, if you're familiar with the Latin mass, you should be familiar somewhat with the Latin, but we're going to dig into it and learn the Latin, learn Latin comprehension, vocabulary, grammar. This is the degree that I have. I have BA in Greek and Latin. And we'll be talking a little bit about Greek as well today with one of the guild questions that we have. So you can go to meaningofcatholic.com slash academy to support us. You can also go to meaningofcatholic.com slash register to join the guild. As always, we promote the guild community by releasing the first 10 or 15 minutes of the guild family stream publicly. And if you want the rest of the story, you have to become a guild member meaningofcatholic.com slash register. So the first question is uh, one of my favorite questions to discuss, which is the Holy Scripture. And this is, uh, before I get into the, the specific topic, um, my book, Introduction to the Holy Bible, which is that the course is based on, this is the textbook, along with the Holy Bible itself, but there's a chapter in this book called Refute Protestants in Five Minutes. And so we're, we're going to talk about that in just a minute uh, and how, why is it is, why it is so easy because of presuppositionalism. You have to go to the presupposition about everything in order to look at how the Protestants take the entire Bible out of its context. The Bible itself has a context. So let me get back to that in a minute, but first let's get, let's dig into the Holy Scripture so this is from Terence. He says, 2 Peter 3.9 appears to say that God wishes all men to come to repentance. This is a verse often used to refute limited atonement theory. However, this Calvinist, as he was discussing with the Calvinist, pointed to me 1 Peter 1.1.2, 1, 1, where Peter addresses God's elect. The Calvinist says that this shows that the Christians that Peter is addressing the latter in his 2 Peter 3.9 passage and are also God's chosen elect, a limited group, and not literally all men. So unfortunately, we're going to need to discuss what is Calvinism real quick. If you're not familiar with this, it is really a ghastly heresy. It's like a Christian Mohammedanism really is what it is. And so uh, it, it comes from the basic errors of Martin Luther, where he misunderstood a lot of fundamental aspects of grace, which led him to assert that there is no human free will. Because grace, said Luther, literally chooses some to go to heaven and chooses some to go to hell based on nothing but God's choice. So it's not like good guys go to heaven, bad guys go to hell, like I teach my kids. It's that God, everybody's a bad guy, and God just chooses and forces, this is the key term we want to say, 
God forces people to go to heaven and he forces them to go to hell based on nothing whatsoever, except that he chooses it because Luther reasoned that if, if it has to do with anything that God, that man does, then it's no longer grace. It's no longer an unmerited uh, favor and love from God. What he misunderstood was that good works themselves are actions of grace. As St. Paul says, Christ working in me, grace working in me. And so St. Augustine says that when God crown, he, when God rewards our merits, he crowns his own gifts. And this is the key that Luther was missing and Kelvin picks up on and he, he runs with it and he creates what's called the tulip, which is this, the five point Calvinism, the Calvinist doctrine, because if you start with this, this false sola fide, sola gratia, uh, notion, it leads you into all these different things. Because if God is choosing everybody to go to heaven and some people to go to hell, what he's that means that Christ only died and shed his blood for these elect and did not shed his blood for those who are damned. And God simply forces people to go to heaven, and that's whom God for whom Christ died. Christ did not die for all. This is what's called limited atonement theory. This is the Calvinist notion. Now, all of this, now we 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 should concede one aspect to the Calvinists is that what they're trying to do is they're trying to safeguard God's grace and they're trying to safeguard safeguard God's transcendence. That is their main concern. So this is something you, you need to emphasize when you talk to a Calvinist is you need to present the, the Catholic notions of grace and the Catholic notions of God's transcendence, because uh, that is what they're concerned about. So you need to alleviate their fears that the Catholic doctrine does in fact safeguard God's grace and does in fact safeguard God's transcendence and his provident will. And there is a mystery contained in, in, in a number of these things, the mystery of human freedom, which we'll get into as well with our next question. So first of all, I what I want to do is go into the very context of the Holy Scripture, because when St. Peter speaks of God's election, what is the context of the term election? The context is the election of Israel, that God says, I have chosen you, O Israel, to be my firstborn among the nations. It is the choosing of Israel, which is the election into which the Gentiles are grafted. So this is the election of Israel. Israel is chosen, and by baptism, the Gentiles are grafted into the Israel of God. This is the context. If we extrapolate a bunch of theories that are based on 15, you know, 16th century Renaissance humanist controversies that Calvin and Calvin was, was talking about. That's totally out of context as to what first, uh, St. Peter is talking about. When he talks about the elect, he's talking about those who have been grafted into this, that same election of Israel. Israel is the elect first son, uh, firstborn son of God, according to the prophets, according to the Old Testament. That is the election of God. That's what we're talking about. We're taught that's what St. Peter's talking about. That's the whole context of the New Testament. So when we look, however, at the the, the verses here cited, so when we talk about this, uh St. Peter is talking about the election that the Gentiles are grafted into Israel. And then we have 2 Peter 3 9. God is not wishing any to be lost, but all to come to repentance. So the, the phrasing of this verse really just disallows any sort of limited atonement. Yes, he's speaking to the elect because the Gentiles have been grafted into the election of, of Israel, but that can, that can exist concurrently with the phrase of this contrasting phrase in this, in this construction of verse 9. This is 2 Peter, again, chapter 3, verse 9. He's contrasting that God is... He is willing, bul, bulemonos, 
uh, bulomenos, which is he is willing, he his will, God's will, is willing that not that there should not be any who are lost, but all come to repentance. So there's a contrast between any and all. He is not willing that any should be lost, but that all should come to repentance. So there is no there is no contradiction between this statement that God is willing that all should be all should be uh, come to repentance, and that some are elect because some have responded to grace, which itself is an action of grace. Is that the, the Calvinist notions cannot make distinctions between God's will because they're concerned about God's transcendence, but God Himself can transcend that concern that God is greater than that, that concern. He is more transcendent and he can provide that mystery, this, this mystery of his own will that he can will something and yet allow human freedom to assert itself. I, another even more explicit verse is from St. Paul, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, who God, speaking of, about God, he wished, this time the Greek is theli, another similar word as willing. God's will is that pantas anthropus, sothene. Pantas, all anthropus, men. All men to be saved. God wishes all men to be saved. But this, this, this harkens back to the parable of our Lord when he sends out the invitation. And people reject the invitation. He sends the invitation to everybody. He wishes all to be saved. And yet they, they finally get everybody into the wedding feast. And then there's the guy without the wedding garment. And then the end is many are called, few are chosen. And this is the realities that some God gives the freedom to reject his own grace. And this is not a rejection of his own freedom or God's own transcendence. Now, we need to step, take a step back here and look at the entire context of the Holy Scripture. Because the entire context of the Holy Scripture is that the Scripture itself is passed down in the cultus of the early church. The cultus of the early church is the Holy Mass. And it is read in the lectionary, passed down already from the synagogue readings, developed in the apostolic rites. And this is the context in which the Bible is written. It's the very thing it's written. So when the Protestants even take these things and utilize the Bible this way, they're taking the entire scripture out of its context. The concept of a private Bible reading, for us to just take a Bible and read it privately, that does not exist until we start having Bibles to be printed. So the entire Protestant notion of even utilizing the Bible this way is a, an invention of the Renaissance. And as I discuss in my book, we cannot impose Renaissance thinking on a first century AD text. It's completely anachronistic. And this is, these, if you turn back the wheel to the presuppositions of the Protestants, you have to admit the very basic Catholic doctrines of tradition, because the New, the New Testament itself, as, as Scott Hahn says, the Holy Eucharist, the New Testament was a sacrament before it was a book. According to the book, the Gospels themselves say that the, the New Testament, meaning the, the precious blood, this is the blood of the New Testament in my blood, says Christ the Blessed Sacrament, the Holy Eucharist, the Holy Mass. The Holy Mass is the New Testament. The New Testament, as we say it, is the written commentary on the actual New Testament, according to the book of the New Testament. That's the actual context of the, of the Bible. And so if you're not, and you're not even operating in that context, you're utterly misusing the Holy Scripture. We, we were, we, we've, departed from the, the scripture itself, the entire context of the Holy Scripture. So that is the, the fundamental presupposition that you have to have that I will teach in my class, and it's written in my book, 
very, very important aspect of this because it's easy to kind of go back and forth with Protestants and we get into this Bible war and we throw verses at each other. And there's an aspect where that's true, as I just said, as I just d demonstrated, we, we, you know, we look at these verses and we need to look at them. That's important. But we also, we can't get into this back and forth, this sort of this going all around wrangling with the Protestant because it's ultimately useless if we don't go to the presupposition. We have to go there and get there eventually. Otherwise, it'll just be a, a verse war, throwing verses at each other, and it'll get go nowhere. So we will continue our Guild Family stream in just a minute. This is the end of the public portion. If you want the full thing, go to meaningofcatholic.com slash register to discuss all your questions, as well as the most controversial ones. Coming up soon, we'll talk about mass intentions, universalism, and the latest controversies out of Rome. back in just a minute.